जय राधा कुंज विहाय राधा कुंज विहा Bhagavatam, first canto, chapter 14, and this is entitled The Disappearance of Lord Krishna, text number 39. Mm -hmm. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om 
Hare Krishna. <coughs> so we are very happy today to have His Holiness Chandra Moli Swami Maharaj with us in Iskwan Chopai Temple here. Maharaj has been a very close associate of Shishirada Gopinath here. He has been coming here for many, many years, inspiring devotees. Maharaj uh, is a senior Srila Prabhupada disciple and initiating guru in Iskwan. Maharaj came in touch uh, in, the, in the year uh, at the age of 24. And in 1973, Maharaj joined the New Vrindavan community. In the same year, he took initiation with Srila Prabhupada. Maharaj is involved in many projects, uh, primarily in 1980s. Since 1980, he was involved in the uh, ISKCON prison ministry where he would regularly go and regularly go and preach in the prison. And uh, since then, he has been uh, a very important leader, taking a leadership role in ISKCON prison ministry. He has also written a book a very beautiful book on the experiences of how many people in the prison, uh, inmates, who came in touch with the Srila Prabhupada's books and uh, started practicing Krishna consciousness in the prison and then became devotees. Maharaj was uh, based in initially in uh, Chicago for many years and since 2013 now Maharaj has uh, changed his base to Europe in, uh, in Croatia. So Maharaj has been coming regularly to Shishrada Gopinath temple and uh, this is uh, very fortunate for us. Second time in this year, Maharaj has come. Maharaj had come to give the Gaur Purnima festival class. We all remember we were missing so much uh, the offline association. And we, Maharaj was the first one to inaugurate the offline program after the COVID pandemic. So we are very happy to have His Holiness Chandramali Maharaj with us. Let us very heartily welcome uh, His Holiness Chandramali Maharaj to Shishradha Gopinath Temple is Khan Chopati by three times loudly chanting Hari Bo! Hari Bo! So, uh, 39, verse number 39 Kejiti Namayam Tataha Rasta Teja Vibasime Alabda Manavya Gyata Kimba Tata Chiro Sita Kachite Namayam Tata Rasta Teja Vibasime Alabda Manova Vadkyata Kimvatata Jiro Sitaha Kachite Nama Yam Tata Prasta Teja Vibasime Alabda Manova Vagyata Kimvatata Jiro Sitaha
Kachit Weather T I'm sorry Te Your Anamayam Health is all right Health is all right Tata My dear brother Brasta Bereft Teja Luster Vibasi appear may to me alabda mana without respect avagyataha neglected kim whether va or tata my dear brother Chiro Sitaha, because of long residence. So Yudhisthira is inquiring from Arjun. He sees an Arjun in a very different, he sees him in a different way now and he's wondering. So he asks us, my dear brother, please tell me whether your health is all right. You appear to have lost your bodily luster. Is this due to others disrespecting and neglecting you because of your long stay at Dwarka? I read it again. My dear brother, please tell me whether your health is all right. You appear to have lost your bodily luster. Is this due to others disrespecting and neglecting you because of your long stay at Dwarka? Very short purport. From all angles of vision, the Maharaj inquired from Arjun about the welfare of Dwarka, but he concluded at last that as long as Lord Sri Krishna himself was there, nothing inauspicious could happen. At the same time, Arjuna appeared to be bereft of his bodily luster, and thus the king inquired of his personal welfare and asked so many vital questions. Om Ajnan Timirandasya Gnajana Salakaya Chaksu Unmilitam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shri Mahti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Iti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pacharine Nirvasesa Sunyavadi Pastyatya De Satarine Vanchakopa Taru Vishya Kripa Sindhu Ve Bacha Patitanam Bhavane Bhyo Vaishnave Bhyo Namaho Namaha Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadad Har Srivasadi Gaur Bhaktivinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hmm. So Yudhisthira is concerned because he sees something different in, in, in Arjuna that wasn't there before. Very powerful, valiant warrior, uh, personal associate of Lord Sri Krishna and always victorious because of his relationship with Krishna. Now he sees something different. He seems like he's being defeated. He seems like he's, something is wrong, either coming from the outside or from the inside. Outside means others, inside, by his own distress, maybe caused by the outside. But Yudhisthira is not aware that something is changed and this will be revealed to Yudhisthira in due course of time. But his conjecture is that Krishna is still there, so everything has to be all right. Wherever there is Krishna, there is auspiciousness. At the very end of the Bhagavad Gita, Sanjay sums up the whole discussion between Arjuna and Krishna, and he says, now, wherever there is Krishna, the Supreme Lord, 
whereas Arjuna, the expert archer, there will be automatically morality, victory, extraordinary power, and great opulence. So this is a summation when you get to the last verse of a particular scripture, it kind of sums up what the whole scripture centers around. And what is that? In that one, wherever there is Krishna and wherever there is the pure devotee, then everything is auspicious, everything is glorious. There can't be any anomalies, there can't be any defects, because the presence of the Lord changes, makes everything transcendental, and by his pure devotee, everything becomes auspicious. So we hear that, but here we see um, something apparently is different. So he inquires, your health doesn't look so good. You lost your bodily luster. Sometimes we meet a friend or someone we know, or maybe even a relative, and we see something in them that's changed. We immediately become concerned and we acquire as a concerned friend or concerned relative. And usually the first thing we ask is, is your health is all right? <laughs> because it says that uh, Prabhupada also makes that point. And of course, when, uh, when Vishramita Muni came to see King Dasarat, that was one of the first things that King Dasarat asked him is, well, how's, how's your bhajan? How, is everything going well with you? I, personally? So it's just custom. You can say etiquette, quality of a, of a personality, being concerned about the, the welfare and the situation of another person. Of course, that takes the point of an extraordinary and the, the whole mood of preaching is about that, the concern for other, everyone else's welfare on a spiritual platform. But here, something is different, and that is, he doesn't know that Krishna's gone. <laughs> Krishna has left the planet, and because Krishna has left the planet, everything appears to be inauspicious. And Arjuna has this when we say apprehension, which is based on the element of fear, one becomes fearful. We hear that from the previous verse and how fearfulness is not there within the devotees of the Lord because the devotees simply are free from all anxiety because they're always depending on Krishna. But we see even sometimes devotees become fearful and of course, there's always that element that death will come along and then take everything away from me. Or I'm not prepared to go yet. I still have some purification to work on. So there's always that fear of death, or at least the anticipation of death approaching. For a devotee, it's not fear, because the devotee knows that um, wherever they are, Prabhupada uses that example, comparing a devotee to a, 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 he, a, a wheat husking machine. And the word is deki. It's one of the songs by Bhakti Vinod Thakur, where he says, if you take a deki machine and you have it here on earth, what does it do? It, it husks wheat. And if you take it to the heavenly planets, what does it do? It husks wheat. The machine does one thing, that's all. So a devotee is like that. Wherever they are, they're always engaged in devotional service. Whether they're in heaven, hell, or in between, they're always engaged in devotional service. So for a devotee, they never worry about, they, the only anxiety they have is that they want to serve Krishna in the best possible way and please Krishna. That is a transcendental anxiety which does not cause one to go down. It, it simply increases one's uh, bhakti. Prabhupada mentions this point that anxiety in Krishna consciousness is good. It's that not only does he say it's good, he says it's actually transcendental. 
And he says it's rarely attained that a person actually comes to the stage of being anxious for pleasing Krishna, anxious for sp spreading Krishna consciousness, anxious that their quality of devotional service needs to be improved. So this anxiety is actually transcendental. And what does it do? It actually increases one's devotional service. Sometimes people say, well, how can I tell about anxiety, whether it's good or not? Well, material anxiety causes you to lose enthusiasm for the activities you're performing. Spiritual anxiety causes you to increase. <laughs> so when, when that is the more or less the dividing line or the indicator that if we are increasing in our anxiety, then we are also increasing in our devotional service. <laughs> and that anxiety doesn't debilitate or cause one to go down. Whereas in material anxiety causes fear, confusion. Like I heard one story about this element of fear, because fear is very powerful. It's one of the anomalies, or one of the principles that governs the material existence is very strong. And of course, the Bhagavatam explains, or at least the Bhagavad Gita also explains that a devotee is abhayam. Uh, Bhaya means fear, abhay means without fear. Bhaktivedanta, Prasila Prabhupada's name was A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. A.C. means abhay charana, Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. In other words, a person who is completely fearless. <laughs> Prabhupada was asked one time. <laughs> yeah. It's an interesting statement. Prabhupada, he said, they were talking to Prabhupada when he was a young man. They had heard he would, he was, there was a building that, that was being built in Calcutta where Prabhupada was. And so they had the scaffolding, you know, with the bamboo structure for building the building. And Prabhupada climbed all the way up to the top <laughs> by himself without any assistance. And the devotee said, oh, Prabhupada, you're so fearless. Prabhupada said, yes. I must be, I had to do that in order to come to your country. <laughs> so yeah, Prabhupada illustrated that he had no fear at all. He always depended on Krishna. But I heard one particular story which teaches the element of fear because devotees should never be in anxiety or fear, at least materially, because it causes one to go down. You can see Arjun here. He's, a, he's really experiencing that fear. What will happen now that Krishna's gone? Because that's somewhat mixed between transcend, transcendental and his own understanding. But in that story, there's a nice story I heard. It's interesting. Just to help us understand how debilitating and how uh, destructive the element of fear is where it's a story, it's in what we say an antidote, but it has a nice point where well, one man, he's, he's from a small town and he's walking around in the small town and he sees at the gate of the town, he sees this man who's very big and he's all dressed in black. <laughs> so he gets curious, who is this person? So he goes over and he says, excuse me, but we've never seen you before here. Who are you? You dressed all in black. The man has a thing over his face also. And he lifts it up and he says, I'm death. <laughs> I've come to take 500 people in this town within the next month. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so the man is really shocked and he's kind of like thinking, so he immediately leaves the scene, and now he's thinking, I should warn people. Death has come, and 500 of us are no longer going to be here after a month. So he tells everybody, <laughs> death has come, be careful, we're all 500 of us, we don't know which 500, we're going to lose our lives. 
So uh, one month is passed, and now the toll was not 500, but it was 5,000 instead of 500. So death is still there by the gate, and the same man, he somehow or other, he's still there. He comes back to death and he says, death, you know, uh, you said you were going to take 500, but you took 5,000. Death said, no, I took 500, 4,500 died out of fear. <laughs> A pretty powerful story when you think about it. People become, when, when some of that element of fear, and then what is fear of not getting, fear of losing, fear of not enjoying what I have attained, and ultimately, as Shakespeare said, the fear of death. But death, there's no such thing as death. Death is simply in a, is an imagination. Death is just a word, it has no meaning at all, because there is no such thing as death. We use that word, but we use it in the wrong context, to give a point. It has some meaning, but ultimately it doesn't exist, because the body is never alive. The body is always dead. So, when the soul, in the beginning of life, enters into the womb of the mother, it, it, it agitates the womb and then the body forms within the womb of the mother and then it grows into a, a living being, a living, uh, a material body. And so by the presence of the soul, the body grows and the body develops and the body acts and the body, everything about the body is simply due, or at least the animation, everything is due to the presence of the soul. So the body is just a combination. Bhumir papana lo bhayu kambano bodhi eva cha ahankarti itiyam me bina prakriti astada. Earth, water, fire, air, ether, mind, intelligence, and false ego. These things are inanimate objects, and they make up different combinations of material bodies. And we think, at least we perceive, that the body actually is alive. The alive force is the soul within the body not the body itself. So when the soul enters into the body, the body develops and, and acts. And at one point, it'll leave the body, and that is called death, and then the body no longer functions. And it starts to deteriorate because the presence of the soul, which is life-giving, which gives nourishment to the body also, aside from developing the body, is no longer there. And therefore, that is called death. But therefore, there is no such thing as death because the living being cannot die. Nahanyate hanyanmani sirire ajo nitcho shyasvato yam purano. That the, the soul is eternal, unborn, immutable, immovable, unchangeable. Um, but when it comes into the material body, it appears to merge with the material body. Uj Uddhava asked this question to Krishna in the 11th canto of Srimad Bhagavata. How is it that the soul is so intimately related with the body that it appears to enter into the body and lose its own existence? And Krishna, Krishna agrees to him that, yes, yeah, the bodily concept of life, that external energy, although it's inferior, it's less powerful than the soul itself because the soul loses its connection with its source, Krishna, it becomes defeated and becomes overwhelmed by another energy, which is the material energy. And in that, in that, uh, what we say, unnatural state, because to take a material body is considered to be an unnatural situation. And we look around the world, everybody has a body, there's so many bodies, Scriptures define that there are 8,400,000 species and there's five or six different types of body and then there's so many varieties within the species. And so everything seems to be normal when it's, when it's defined in the external way, but behind the whole thing is just a show. <laughs> this whole material world is a dream, it's just an illusion. The soul is thinking, well, yeah, I'm a man, I'm a woman, I'm, a, I'm 
I'm happy, I'm sad. In other words, you can put so many things after the I principle and all of these define in what is called a hunkara. A simply a situation which is a, the result of one's dreaming of oneself different from one as actually is. We all know this, this basic simple philosophy, but Krishna spent 20 verses, we could say, statements, more than 20 in the very beginning of Bhagavad Gita, just to make the point. Just like sometimes Prabhupada, Prabhupada was saying to, uh, devotees were talking to Srila Prabhupada about this one person. And Prabhupada was talking very basic. He was a guest, he was some kind of scientist or something. He had some scientific degrees. And Prabhupada was talking the difference between the, the soul and the body. And the man said, no, 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 let's talk about higher knowledge. <laughs> and Prabhupada, you know, he, he stuck to that point. And then later he explained to the devotees, he wants higher knowledge, but he doesn't even know he's not this body. <laughs> so without that, that's why Krishna spent so much time and detailed explanation to help us in the form of giving it to Arjuna, the difference between the soul and the body, or the difference between what is material and what is spiritual, the difference between what is alive and what appears to be alive, which is not. So that fa that's the foundation for understanding higher knowledge. And so this fear concept is based on the principle of the body. So therefore, when, when one thinks in terms of that I die, then that's material, I don't die. We go from one place to another. Karanun guna sangha so sadhasa joni janmasu. Well, that's in the material realm. But for devotee, devotee doesn't think, well, where else do I want to go in this material existence that may be a little bit better than where I am now? <laughs> Maybe I should go to the heavenly planets because I heard it's pretty nice up there, right? And you get the women are quite nice looking and they, they speak very sweetly and they not only speak, they sing when they speak. And there's nice food up there, better than down here. Everything's cooked in ghee. <laughs> and uh, so many other things that are not there, that are here that we don't really need and want. So sometimes we think, you know, a better material situation would allow uh, me more facility for happiness or even maybe more facility to do my devotional service. But actually, it's not. The, the example was given by King Chichuketu. When King Chichuketu, he had somewhat achieved the, the state of liberation after being in the body and then of a king and he freed himself from that bodily conception of life he uh, he received the mercy of Narada Muni and Parvat Muni too I think both of them and uh, now he was a free spirit flying on his uh, Vimana going everywhere around the universe he still had some tinge of some material desire he still wanted to enjoy higher a happiness, material happiness. And therefore, in that, in that body that he had, he came across the situation where there was an assembly of sages and Lord Shiva was with Parvati. And Parvati was sitting on the lap of Shiva and Shiva was presiding over this assembly of sages. And Lord Brahma was there and many of the other great demigods also. King Kittriketu, when he saw the situation, he thought, this is quite, quite humorous. How is it possible that Shiva, who is such a you know, great personality, he has his wife sitting on his lap in the front of all of these sadhus and demigods, and there's assembly going on. So he laughed. 
Shiva didn't take any issue with that. But uh, Parvati didn't like it. He was laughing because he, he felt it was unusual, not because it was funny. It was like a, uh, when you come across something that is, surprises you and it's out of context, apparently, at least in, as it appeared in this case, you might decide to, you know, laugh <laughs> as, as something unusual. And that's what he did, but Parvati didn't see it that way. So she became angry and then uh, she actually called him and he came and then she cursed him. She said, you rascal, who do you think you are? And she, she cursed him. She said, you, you are offending Lord Shiva. You think you're better than Lord Shiva. All of the great demigods and, and sages are sitting here and they're not saying anything. And now you are, you're taking exception. You think you're better than Lord Brahma and all of these demigods. So she gave him a quite a heavy chastisement. <laughs> and he said, Mother, uh, uh, thank you very much. <laughs> he was immediately humbled. And he accepted that humility as an opportunity uh, to show his devotion. And he, uh, he just stood, stood there and she said, and she said, you should go to hell. <laughs> And she was there and she was listening to the whole thing and he's astonished to see how he's accepting all this chastisement and then finally she says, you belong in hell. <laughs> and uh, so Chichiketu, he just offered his obeisances and said, thank you, mother, I'm on my way to hell. And then Shiva, he had to say something. He said, this is the glory of the Vaishnavas, whether they're in heaven, whether they're in hell, or wherever they are. And use the example of a compass. If you want to align a compass, you always align it with the northern direction. That's how they create compasses. So a devotee is always fixed on the Supreme Personality of Godhead, whether they're in Mumbai, or they're in Goa, <laughs> or they're in New York, <laughs> or they're in Pataloka. In other words, the material situations may affect to some degree, but that doesn't disturb the devotee's focus on the Supreme Personality of Godhead. In fact, when situations change to become somewhat less favorable, it becomes a greater opportunity for devotees to go deeper into their practice of Krishna consciousness. Just like I preach in jail. And this is a place where, you know, it's not it's a nice place. It's basically the jails and certain countries in the world are, are really horrible places. I mean, really horrible. The, the inmates are mistreated, abused, and say even the facilities are not good. Of course, some jails are better than others, but most jails are like that. So there was one situation where I got a letter about about six months ago, maybe more, maybe almost a year ago, where one young man, he had just connected with us through Prabhupada's books, so he was writing devotees. And he had written this, this letter describing what happened to him when he was in jail. And so the whole jail came down with the coronavirus. And the jailers, or at least the people who were conducting the jail, decided not to do anything to help the inmates. They didn't make any provisions to cure the inmates. They thought, of course, this is the way it is in jails in some place, they don't care. So this one young man, he had just come to Krishna conscious and he just started reading Prabhupada's books and he was chanting Hare Krishna and he came down with a very, as he describes it, apparently very severe a case of coronavirus. So he thought, I'm gonna die. 
and there's nobody here to help me. So he just went into his place, his cell, and started to chant. And he continued to chant. He didn't stop. <laughs> he just chanted and chanted and prayed and chanted. And after a week, he was completely cured of coronavirus. And he was back to normal again, just by chanting a Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. He had that kind of faith. Well, you might say, we, we don't know about the extent of his faith, but at least he understood, where else can I go except to Krishna? <laughs> and he put all his attention, his heart, his prayer, energy, on just chanting and praying to the Lord. And somehow the Lord, by the Lord's mercy, he, he completely was cured. Completely. I mean, he had no symptoms of the virus, and he was completely well again. So, so I received that letter that he had wrote. I was amazed. Amazed in the sense that he had such faith in the holy name. That was the amazement. And so there are examples where people are put into hellish situations. I tell that one story where when Prabhupada was here in India back in 1971, I think the Bangladeshi war was going on, 71, and I was around that time. And Prabhupada had sent some senior sannyasis to preach in Bangladesh during the war. So they were preaching there, and then the war was getting worse, and Prabhupada was getting worried about them. So he started to send out some letters to try to bring them back, but because of the war, all, all communication was broken, so he couldn't reach them. So while they were there, uh, some of the people who were there, they were preaching to, they said, well, you know, it's getting really dangerous here. You better leave the country. And at the same time, the Islamic army was arranging buses for refugees to get out of the country anybody who wanted to leave, but when they, the buses would go <clears throat> and they would check the buses at the border to see who was leaving the country. <clears throat> if there were certain people that they felt shouldn't leave or were enemies of the state, they would take them off and persecute them or even kill them. So these two sannyasis, it was, I think it was Brahmananda was one of them, and I think the other one who was pushed to Krishna Maharaj, they got on the bus. <laughs> and so they're thinking, well, we should leave. So they got to the border, and they were stopped by the Islamic army, and they saw these two sadhus. They pulled them off the bus, and they put them in front of a firing squad, and they were going to kill them. So Brahmananda's there, and pushed to Krishna's there, and they're just ready to go. All of a sudden, Brahmananda, he, he has his beads with him. He holds them up in the air and he starts yell, speaking really loud. Hey, we're going back to Godhead. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare. And then I think the other sannyasi, he got the message too. So they both were just, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, we're going back to God, Hare, Hare Krishna. And then the Islamic army got completely bewildered. They didn't know what was happening. So the leader came over and said, get back on the bus and get out of here. So, <laughs> so they, they threw him out. Rake Krishna, more ke, more Krishna, Rake ke. <laughs> Uh, yeah, the, and well, well, the, actually, the, other, the, the, real, uh, the real mantra is, you know, what is that? Kuntiha pratijani hi me me bhakta pranasyati. My devotee will always be glorious. He always protects his devotee. So, yeah, that, the difficult situations bring about greater amounts of bhakti. We don't really need that, though. We don't want that, right? We got enough difficult situations. You know, sometimes the prashadam's not right. <laughs> or some, somebody's snoring in the ashram, right? <laughs> so that's not so good either. <laughs> so, you know, we have enough problems. 
and trying to preach to the non-devotees who think they know everything. <laughs> or you get a sannyasi here that has so many demands and the, and the guest services can't keep up with it, you know. So many problems. <laughs> So yeah, it's so. Uh, but but when these situations come by way of providence, and providence means by higher powers, then they there are opportunities to go deeper into our our bhakti, and Krishna is always there. So our our June, he's he's so overwhelmed with the fact that Krishna is no longer there that he can't even tell uh, Yudhisthira because he doesn't want him to experience the same suffering and anxiety that he is experiencing. So this will go on for some time and then finally it becomes revealed, the situation. So wherever Krishna is, the, everything is auspicious, but Krishna cannot be any place. Krishna cannot be not in any place. He's always everywhere. So how is it possible? But apparently in his personal form, when he was there with his devotees, that disappearance caused because of the attachment became so strong. But we also can learn that this is just like sometimes a, a, a devotee will leave. We were just, uh, what was it? We were just honoring or Srila Prabhupada on his disappearance day just about a couple of weeks ago. And devotees were speaking. I was in Mayapur at the time. And many of the devotees were saying the same thing. Prabhupada's not gone. <laughs> He's still here. He's here in his bhakya. He's here in his devotees. He's here in so many ways. He's here in his deity form. So, although it apparently is not the same, it is the same. It's simultaneously the same and not the same. So Krishna can never leave. Krishna is always with his devotees. Even if the devotee leaves Krishna, Krishna never leaves the devotee. Krishna never leaves anyone, but because the non-devotees don't want Krishna, they can't experience his presence. Therefore, they can't take advantage of his mercy. And because they don't want his mercy, they get another kind of mercy. And that is, they get the, they get the struggle with the material energy. Maya devase kacho bese, kacho ha bububu by jiv krishna das e vishwash kole dana dukanai. And then the living entity simply struggles. Why? Because they forgot Krishna. And so. So that's why Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati used to say, there's only one problem. All of these old, other so-called problems are extensions of the one problem, forgetfulness of Krishna. And so. And as soon as you remember Krishna, you're with Krishna. Prabhupada also said that. He said, if you remember Krishna, you will never be impeded, he uses that word, impeded or blocked, restricted from anything you do, as long as you remember Krishna. When Krishna is there, everything becomes auspicious. <laughs> so, Arjuna, he's remembering Krishna, but in the mood of separation. But that mood of separation also is the higher element of love. It, it brings about greater love for the personality of Godhead, for the pure devotee in that mood of separation. And that mood of separation creates a longing within the heart that brings that soul back in connection with that personality, Krishna or the pure devotee in an unmanifested form, but actually it manifests later on when that devotee also leaves the world, then immediately that mood of separation brings, brings about uh, union again. In other words, we create that mood of separation and that helps us to come back to Krishna at the end of life. 
The cre cre Krishna is here, but he's not here. <laughs> Simultaneously. But Krishna is always with us. As long as we remember him and follow the instructions given by him through his pure devotee. Okay, so I'll stop there. Hare Krishna. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Do we have time for questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. Just speak real loud. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Maharaj, for the wonderful class. Uh, Maharaj, uh, you were telling that uh, when some difficult situations come in life, it is an opportunity to become more Krishna conscious. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, we don't really need that, but that's just the way we function. <laughs> So, uh, my question was regarding this only, that uh, at least I am, I become very fearful. Nothing very uh, problematic has happened in my life, but when we hear about the Pandavas or Prahlad Maharaj, so uh, when we come and in front of the deities and tell, oh Krishna, my life is yours and do whatever you like, but in my heart of hearts I am fearful that anything happens to me like, you know, the way it happened to Pandavas or other great devotees, I will not be able to take it. So, like, what should be our prayer uh, in uh, such situation? Well, you should take shelter of devotees who can encourage you in the right understanding with good association and hearing from senior devotees to help you go through your struggles you have to come to the, usually initially when something happens that we don't like or something doesn't happen that we want to happen, and the, the anxiety is the first uh, indicator. We become lost or confused or fearful. But that's just a step. The next step is that what do I do? It's a reality. <laughs> and when you get to the sense that it's a reality, then you have to come to the to the understanding that I have to live, I have to go on in my life. And now I have to live in this situation. So what is my, what is the proper consciousness? What is the proper understanding? And that, there's a statement in the Christian tradition that kind of illustrates this. The Lord and this is from the Christian statement. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the Lord. <laughs> so he gives and he takes away. It doesn't change our relationship with the Lord. In other words, it does, our relationship doesn't go down when he takes something away. It doesn't get better when he gives us something. Because Giving and taking is just part of this, the life we live in. We get things, we lose things. We get good health, we get ill health, we get good health again. We get some money, we lose some money. I go to the, I go to the, the check-in counter and I say, here I am, and they say, well, you have to pay another 20,000 rupees for your excess baggage. I say, oh my God, the Lord taketh away. <laughs> so, you know, so, you know, it's, and they use the, you know, Indigo Airlines to take it away. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the Lord is like, you know, what can we do? You just have to realize the, the, the only loss, and Radhanath Maharaj just makes this very succinct statement. He says, 
if you lose your money, you lose nothing. Think about that one. You lose your money, you lose nothing. You lose your health, you lose something. Because health is important, it helps us to execute devotional service. When we're in an unhealthy situation, we cause problems for others and for ourselves. And it makes life difficult, and we have to struggle. And maybe sometimes our service gets impaired. So we want Prabhupada writes, I hope this meets you in the best of health, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami. And also the Bhagavatam in the second chapter, the first canto, says one should desire a healthy life. So we can execute the goal of life, which is Krishna consciousness. And then the last part of the statement is if you lose your health, you lose something. And if you lose Krishna, there's nothing left. <laughs> Even if you are, you know, a multi-billionaire, if you don't have Krishna, what's the use? You're going to go to hell anyway. Without Krishna, there's nothing. And with Krishna, is everything. So you can't lose Krishna unless you want to. <laughs> so <laughs> that's the rare gem and that's the, that's the, so stay Krishna conscious despite whatever happens in your life. Loss and gain will come. That's the way it is. And of course we go through a little difficulties when it first happens, but then we have to come to that consciousness that this is the, now the new situation. I have to go on with my life and my devotional service. Sometimes we lose a loved one that's very dear to us, and that takes a lot out of a person for a while. I know people who have lost loved ones 20 years ago, and they, they still haven't got over it yet. <laughs> <laughs> but that's life you just have to understand this material world it goes through six changes and the last one and things are gone <laughs> nothing, nothing in this material world can endure it's like Prabhupada tells that story of Lomasa Rish that sadhu uh, he had a benediction that for every hair on his body, he would live one life of Brahma, Lord Brahma. And Prabhupada said he was a very hairy sage. <laughs> so, he's living on the banks of the river. He has uncountable millenniums of lifetimes ahead of him. So, he doesn't have any place. So, he has a few followers, so they say... Uh, Guru Maharaj, can we build you a, you know, a place? You're living on the banks of the, of the river. You don't have many shelter. And uh, they're they're concerned about their guru. So, but he says, uh, don't bother. I'm not going to be here so long. <laughs> so yeah, whatever short time you hear, whatever you can accumulate. Use it in devotional service. Whatever you don't have, don't worry about it. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> We're always thinking, if I have this, I'll be happier. It's usually the other way around. If I could lose this, I'll be happier. <laughs> That's usually the, the, the statement that has more validity. But that's just the way the material world is. Things come and things go. Mm -hmm. While you have them, use them, and when they're, when you, if you don't have them, don't worry about them. <laughs> Krishna will always give you food, don't worry. <laughs> and association with devotees is available, <laughs> and devotional service is always available. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Is there anyone else? Yes. Are we here?
Please accept my humble obeisances. Glories to Srila Prabhupada. Hare Krishna, welcome. Uh, uh, my question is, as we grow old, uh, our uh, capacity to adjust with the changes become less. Uh, why does that happen and how can one yeah. overcome that? The, the Prabhupada talks about that too. How we preach and when we preach we find that it's harder for older people to come to Krishna conscious. Younger people are more inclined to because as people get older they become set in their ways and to change becomes more a unnatural pattern for an older people as they get older and older. They get into their routines, they get into their ways. So there's a statement in, in uh, English, it's kind of a, it says, uh, you can't teach new tricks to old dogs. An old dog can't learn new tricks. <laughs> So yeah, it's just the way it is. Life starts to cement itself in a certain way and we get conditioned to doing what we want to do. And that's the miracle of Srila Prabhupada. Prabhupada was 70 years old and he changed his whole life <laughs> at 70. And when you think about that, how many people can even think about doing that? What to speak about doing it? <laughs> So that's true, that's, that's, that's just a feature of life. As people get older, they don't change so easily. Or they can't accept change so easily. But a devotee should know that, you know, at some time I have to leave this world, so I should be ready to leave. So let me prepare now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's just a feature of life that as people get older, they get, they call, we call it set in their ways. They become fixed in the way they, they want to run their life. So the devotional life little helps in being flexible, is it? The devotional life, does it, it helps in being little flexible, even when we grow Well, it, it opens you up to another reality that there is much more beyond this world and there's something wonderful and that is the spiritual world and that's and that's the goal of life is to get out of this place and go to a better place but the better place is not, not anywhere in this material world because Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita Dukkhalaya Masyashvatam, he says, every place in this material world is suffering and is temporary. So that better place is the, the, uh, the Paravyoma, or the spiritual world, mm -hmm. where Krishna is. So, therefore, we have to hear about Krishna as much as possible, chant Krishna's name, get involved in devotional service, and, and change our consciousness back to our normal consciousness. Material consciousness is an anomaly. Spiritual consciousness is consciousness. It's just like, uh, what would be an example? If you, if you have a set of glasses, right? and you looking through the glasses, you can see the external environment. But somebody gives you a pair of glasses with yellow color lenses, then everything looks yellow. Somebody gives you one with purple, it looks purple. So whatever vision, whatever instrument you're seeing through, the world is like that. So in pure consciousness, mm -hmm. or Krishna consciousness, we see Krishna everywhere and everything in Krishna. And we see ourselves as alta only the servant of Krishna and nothing else. That's, that's real consciousness, that's pure consciousness, that's natural. So we should understand that the consciousness that I am in now is just an anomaly. 
it's not the real consciousness. Our real consciousness is pure Krishna consciousness. We have to work towards the bringing about that consciousness. So don't be afraid to change <laughs> in the right way. <laughs> so. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Thank okay. you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Srila Prabhupada ki jai. Srimad Bhagavatam ki jai.